and welcome to the second lecture on the first chapter of your book in University of Physics 1. Now, uh, in this lecture I'm going to discuss unit conversion I'm also going to discuss in some detail uh, dimensional analysis and um, I'll mention something called uh, approximations and uh, estimates, Fermi calculations. Um, your, your first chapter goes into them a little bit. Uh, I feel it's best that uh, you pick it up as the course progresses and we don't spend a whole lot of time on it. Uh, so you'll get it as the course goes on. Now that said, um, if you remember our last lecture, uh, I had mentioned that uh, you know one of the reasons why we use the uh, the international system and not the uh, imperial system uh, in in the sciences is because uh, going between units uh, like for example of length uh, involves powers of ten. So just as a simple example of unit conversion, we're going to look at one of those uh, now. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what your foundation with respect to unit conversion is. If you had chemistry, you're probably intimately familiar with converting between units. Uh, in fact, you probably lost many, many points trying to figure out how to get there. Now, that said, uh, in physics, we look at unit conversion a little differently, perhaps, than, than, than the way they did in chemistry. Um, and that's because uh, of how closely physics and mathematics are related. Now. Uh, if you've ever um, uh, had an algebra course uh, and uh, your, your teachers tried to, to, to sell you on it, uh, they may have mentioned that most of algebra involves you multiplying things by one and adding zeros to stuff. And that's because when you multiply something by one, you don't change the meaning of it. If you add zero to something, you don't change the meaning of it. So that said, um, let's look at a simple conversion between uh, kilometers and meters. So let's pretend that you had uh, 15 kilometers. And what I'd like to do is to express this as meters. Now, uh, many of you are probably already looking at this and saying, oh yeah, this is easy, I can just write the answer down. Uh, and we are going to do that. But uh, what I'd like to point out here is the relationship between kilometers and meters. So we know kilo means a thousand. So there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. These things are equivalent. Now they're not the same. Equivalent means similar to. They are like each other but it doesn't mean the same as. Now, what I'd like to do is to divide both sides by one kilometer. Now, units uh, work a lot like uh, numbers and variables do in, 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 um, in algebra. Uh, if you have the same thing on the top and, and on the bottom, then they can cancel each other out, uh, giving you one. So let's look here on the right-hand side. Uh, there's a one here, there's a one here, one divided by one is one. There's a kilometers here, and a kilometers here, and kilometers divided by kilometers is one, which means that this is the same thing as one. So what that means is, is that when you have a conversion that looks like this, or let's say that we instead divided both sides by a thousand instead of one kilometer, uh, you would have something that looks like this. That would be the same thing as one, and if you were to multiply a number by it, you aren't going to fundamentally change the number. Now the number might look different, but because of the units, that tells you it's still the same number, it's just being expressed differently. So you're not changing its fundamental meaning. So like I said, multiplying by one or adding zeros to stuff. So for example here, 
if I have 15 kilometers, I have two relationships between kilometers and meters that I can look at to express this as meters. The one that I want is going to get rid of the kilometers and put meters there instead. So here, I want one that has kilometers on the bottom so we can cancel out the kilometers on the top. And I, have, I want one that has meters on the top so I can get meters at the end of the day. And it's this one right here that'll do it. There are 1,000 meters for every one kilometer. The kilometers cancel. Anything divided by one is itself. And 15 times 1,000 is 15,000 meters. Now look, you see how I put the unit at the end? That tells me what the relevance of this number is. Now, this is an acceptable way of writing the number. Another way you could write the number, though, is to express it in scientific notation. Now, in scientific notation, what you do is you condense the number down to the point to where it is pure number with something that is exponential in, in tens. So this would be the same thing as 1.5, that's pure number, times I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 to the fourth meters. This is the preferred way of writing things like that. Right there. So, a simple example that shows you how this works. Now, uh, if you think about uh, the process that we, we used here to come up with these conversions, um, it's, it's actually pretty easy. This is the same thing as saying, for every 1,000 meters, I have one kilometer. Or, for every one kilometer, I have 1,000 meters. So as long as you can remember that in the back of your head, then you can write these conversions down very, very easily. So, let's do another one. Um, Let's write uh, 30,000 watts as kilowatts. Now, um, our base unit here is watts. We would like to go to kilowatts. Kilo means 1,000. So what that means is, is that there are 1,000 watts for every one kilowatt. 1,000 watts per kilowatt or one kilowatt for every 1,000 watts. Two different ways you can write it. So 30,000 watts. We want to choose the conversion that gets rid of the watts and puts a kilowatts there because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for kilowatts. Uh, this is the one that I want right there one kilowatt for every 1,000 watts. Now, I have a thousand on the bottom. This a thousand is going to take out three of these guys right there. The watts here is going to take out the watts here, which means that this is the same thing as 30 kilowatts. Now, this is an acceptable way of writing it because the, the, the zeros aren't out of control. All right, so Another simple example. So converting between uh, the metric prefixes is actually pretty easy. As we saw, it's just factors of 1,000 and factors of 10, basically. Um, so um, what I want to do now is to take a look and see what happens when you have more complicated prefix conversions. For example, uh, what I'd like to do is to convert 1.2 square kilometers, so it's an area, two square meters. Now, um, these types of conversions uh, cause a lot of people problems, um, but uh, hopefully by the time we're done with this, uh, it'll be pretty easy to get. So um, the base thing that we're really trying to convert here are lengths. And we know 
that there are 1,000 meters for every one kilometer. We also know that for every one kilometer, there are 1,000 meters. Uh, now, hold on, you're saying. Uh, these aren't lengths, these are areas. But an area is just a length by a length. A length times a length. Okay? So, for example, here, 1.2 kilometers squared. You might say, okay, well, I'm going to convert this pretty easy. Uh, I want to get rid of the kilometers. I want to put a meters there. So clearly this is the conversion that I want, right? Um, 1,000 meters for every one kilometer. Okay, well watch what happens. Um, you have a kilometer here. You get rid of the kilometer here. Uh-oh, no, that's not right. Because look what happened. Kilometers squared is kilometers times kilometers. Is this, isn't that what square means? Is something times itself? So what that means is, is in reality, you got rid of one of the kilometers here, but not both. Which meant that if you just did this conversion once, your units at the end of the day would be a kilometer times a meter, and I've got no idea what that is. So in order to make this work properly, you have to do it twice. 1.2 kilometers squared there are 1,000 meters for every one kilometer. 1,000 meters for every one kilometer. Now watch. You have kilometers squared on the bottom. These two kilometers are going to take out these two kilometers. You also have a meters times a meters, which is a meters squared. And what is it we're looking for? Meters squared. There's a thousand, a thousand, and a 1.2. One, two, three, four, five, six. 1.2 times 10 to the six square meters. And that is our conversion right there. Now, Let's keep on keeping on. Um, so, as you can see, um, going between uh, metric prefixes is pretty easy to do. You just have to be a little bit more careful around things that involve squared or even cubed. Uh, and goodness forbid, even to the fourth power or something like that. But all you do is just to continue to apply the conversion, let algebra do its thing and eventually you'll get to the right answer. Now, uh, what I'd like to do now is to go between systems of units. So, uh, for example, what I'd like to do is to convert five miles to kilometers. And the way I want to do this is uh, not directly between miles and kilometers. But I'd like to involve some of the base units. Uh, the reason being is because I feel like uh, it, it'll help us understand how these conversions can kind of stack and, uh, and get things done. So what do I know? Well, I know that uh, there are 5,280 feet for every one mile, right? Now, I also know that for every one mile, there are 5,280 feet. Now, um, if you look at the relationship between meters and feet, what you'll discover is that 1 meter is the same thing as 3.28 feet. So, for every 1 meter, we have 3.28 feet, and for every 3.28 feet, we have one meter. So there's another conversion. 
Now, we also know that there are 1,000 meters and one kilometer. We also know that there, for every one kilometer, there are 1,000 meters. So, relationships between miles to feet, from feet to meters, and from meters to kilometers. So, five miles. The first thing I'd like to do is to take those miles and put them into the base units for the imperial system, and that's feet. So it's going to be one of these conversions right here. We want to get rid of the miles and put feet there. And uh, I'm thinking this one right here. There are 5,280 feet in one mile. And sure enough, the miles cancel, giving me feet. Now the next thing I want to do is to go from feet to meters. Um, I want to get rid of the feet and put meters there. I'm thinking this conversion right here. For every one meter, there are 3.28 feet. And sure enough, the feet are going to cancel, giving me meters on the top. But that's not enough. We're going to kilometers. So, finally, we want to get rid of the meters and put kilometers there. I'm thinking this one right here. For every one kilometer, there are 1,000 meters. So it's a pretty long and complicated conversion, and truthfully you could look up a direct conversion between miles and kilometers. But what I want to do is to take the long route to show you again how these things stack with each other. Now, if you do the math here, you take 5 times 5,280 divided by 3.28 and then divide it again by 1,000 you get about 8.05 kilometers. Now we're going to talk more about the about later on. So there you go. Here's your relationship between miles and kilometers. So, um, that's unit conversion. Now, um, let's talk about um, the about. So, uh, that falls up under the guise of, uh, of something called significant figures. Now, uh, again, uh, if you've had chemistry, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that you've seen significant figures before, and you've probably lost a lot of points on them, just like I did whenever I was taking it back in the day. Uh, now, that said, uh, people have done their PhDs on how to properly do significant figures. There are um, as many ways um, as there are uh, grains of sand on a beach, basically, when it comes to doing sig figs. Um, the traditional rules uh, go like this. If you're multiplying, Uh, you keep the lowest number of six figs. We're going to talk about what they are in a second. I'm going to abbreviate this as six figs. Uh, this is the same thing for dividing as well. They're complementary operations. Um, if you're adding complementary subtracting. Remember, uh, when you subtract, all you do is add a negative. The same operation, basically. Um, when you're adding, uh, you keep the lowest number of decimal places. Uh, <laughs> 
these two things combined create an enormous nightmare for people. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, we're going to make life a lot easier uh, than having to, to spend all of our time just juggling significant figures. Uh, but to get there, what I want to do is I want to talk more about exactly what significant figures are now that we have the rules um, sort of stated in an obvious manner. So um, significant figures are um, uh, rules that tell us how significant a number is. How much can we trust it? Now, when you measure something in nature, um, you're restricted to the precision that your uh, tool of measurement can give you. Uh, for example, if you look at a, a traditional meter stick, uh, meter sticks will, will measure one meter, they'll measure 100 centimeters. Each centimeter is broken up into 10 millimeters, and that's about where the precision stops. So, for example, with a meter stick, uh, you could measure, uh, let's, let's pretend that you're expressing this in, in meters, you could measure um, one meter um, centimeters to uh, to that, and then maybe a millimeter or two there. Okay, but anything beyond that um, is is an estimation, and estimations aren't trustworthy. Okay, so. Uh, Here's how, here's how this works. So let's pretend that um, you're given the number 1,000. You're told that it's a measurement of, we'll say, feet. And you're asking yourself, how much can I trust this number? We would say that the number 1,000 has one number that is significant. Now, why do we say that? Well, what if you took and uh, you actually measured 750 feet, but you rounded it up. That gives you a thousand. What if you actually measured um, 1,200 feet and you rounded it down? That gives you a thousand. So there's really only one number here that we can trust, and that's that this is about a thousand. So it has one sig fig. Now. What if I wrote a number like this, 1,200 meters? Well, I know that this number here would not be written unless it was relevant. Just like this one right here is relevant too. Uh, 1,200 rounds up or rounds down rather to 1,000. If this wasn't relevant, I would just write 1,000. Okay, so in this situation, you say that you have two significant figures. Um, why not four? Well, unless you're told that this number is precise, um, that 1,200 meters could be a, a consequence of, of measuring, say, uh, 1,160 meters and, and saying, okay, well, I'm not sure that this 60 here is exactly correct, so I'm just going to round it up to about 1,200. See? Or maybe uh, you measured uh, 1,310 in reality, but you're not very clear about that, um, that 10 there. Uh, rather, um, what am I saying, uh, 1,210. Um, and you're not very clear about that 10 there, so you can just round it down, 1,200 meters. Okay, so you see how both of these numbers round it and give you this. So you're really only confident that these two numbers right here probably represent about as good as you're going to get. So you say you have two sig figs. Okay, so uh, following the rules of multiplication, what if I took and I multiplied 1,000 by 1,200. Now I'm going to neglect units here for a moment. Obviously these are just similar, but this is just an example. This right here has two sig figs. This right here has one. The rules for multiplication state that you keep the lowest number. So after you're done with your multiplication here, you're going to take and round whatever it is you get to one sig fig. So, for example, you would get 12, 1.2 million, or 1,200,000. But look, I can only really trust this 
to one sig fig. So uh, I'm going to represent it this way. Or 1 times 10 to the 6. Now look, it's a consequence of rounding. Now, you might feel cheated. Oh, I've lost precision here somehow. No, you haven't, though. Uh, the goal in physics is to represent the numbers um, with the most reasonable amount of trust that you can give them. And here, being reasonable means that we have to accept the fact that we're not certain. And we're representing that uncertainty by keeping the lowest number of significant digits. Now, let's look at some more examples. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, how many significant digits? One, two, three are written, the rest are zeros. Three sig figs. How many significant digits? One, two, okay. If I was uncertain about this zero, and I would also be uncertain about that and would put, probably put a zero there. Nope, didn't happen. Four, they're all significant, okay? The rule of thumb for whole numbers like this when it comes to dealing with or uh, deciding on how many significant digits that you have uh, is, is to start at the first number and start counting until you get nothing but zeros all the way out to the end. When you get to the zeros, that's when you stop counting the number of significant digits. So here, one, two, three, uh, that's not a zero, all four. One, two, three, oh look, all zeros, three. Uh, we'll do another one. One, two, three, four, okay, all zeros, four significant digits. Okay, now, uh, that's all fine and well for whole numbers, but what about, um, oh, I don't know, what about decimals? Well, the rule's sort of an opposite in that one. Uh, a good example of a, a decimal number would be that. What you do is you walk to the right of the decimal place until you hit the first non-zero number. And everything out beyond that is considered significant. Uh, you wouldn't have written written it if it wasn't. So, uh, zero, zero, okay, I see one, one sig fig. Um, 0 0.0293, uh, okay, zero, zero, oh look, okay, uh, one, two, three, three significant. Let's do another. Uh, 0 0.0000052. Uh, okay, zero, 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 zero. Oh, um, first non zero number. I see two of them. Uh, okay, two significant figures. So the, the, the rules are this for a whole number, you start counting at the first number and you stop the minute that you get to all the zeros. For a decimal number, you start counting when you get to the first non-zero number and you just continue to count all the way until you're done. Two sig figs, three sig figs, two sig figs, or sorry, rather one sig fig, three sig figs, uh, two sig figs. Here, three sig figs, four sig figs, four sig figs. Now, what if you have a composite? What if you have a, a true decimal number that looks like this, uh, 5.002? Well, um, if you think about how this works, uh, you start counting here from the left until you get to all zero. Oh, hold on, there's a decimal place here. Anything beyond the decimal place. Oh, hold on. Oh, it's easy here. See, all the numbers are significant. If it's written this way, it's all significant. One, two, three, four. Four, 123,000, uh, or sorry, 12,300. 0.52, uh, 1, 2, oh look, uh, there's stuff out beyond here that's not 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7, okay. So uh, things that are composites, that are hybrid, or uh, that are combinations of whole numbers and decimal numbers, uh, you, they're all significant. If it's just a, a decimal like this, 
then you start counting the minute you get to uh, your first non-zero. Uh, and if it's a whole number that looks like this, you start counting and you keep counting until you get to all zeros. And those tell you how many sig figs you have. Okay. So, for example, let's pretend that I was going to multiply this number right here by this number right here, or divide them. I do my operation, and at the end of the day, I round what I have to the least number. And the least number of significant digits here, it would be 3. Okay? So, it's as easy as that. Now, what do I want for this course from you guys? Well, if you go back and you look at the rules that we had, um, multiplication and, and addition, like that. And we're not going to do any addition examples. There's no reason to. Um, if you were to look at a simple equation that looks something like this, um, why don't we do, hmm, oh, I don't know. Uh, let's take uh, 520, uh, multiply it by um, 0 0.02 plus uh, 1.95. And then divide it by, uh, I don't know, uh, 12.64. Uh, you got a nightmare ahead of yourself. You have to do the addition first. And then when you do the addition, you keep the lowest number of decimal places. Now you have to do, uh, you have to follow order of operation. Uh, what happens next? Multiplication or division? If you, for example, were to take 520 and multiply it by whatever you get here, and then round using significant digits uh, as per uh, you know the rules for multiplication and then divide you would actually get a different number than if you were to take and take this number divide it by this number and multiply it. You have to follow the order of operations to do it. Well the goal here is to learn physics it's not to learn how to to, to follow the order of operation for significant figures. You'd spend more time doing that than you would doing anything else. So the, what we're going to do in this class is the following. When you do a calculation, so when you do a calculation, each number that you're given, find their significant digits. Find sig figs of each number that's involved in the calculation. Do your calculation and then at the very end with your answer round to the least number of sig figs. Okay, so the first thing you do is to find all the sig figs that you have uh, in the calculation. You actually perform the calculation itself without any, round, any rounding or any of that stuff. And then at the very end, you just take the least number that you've been given and you do your calculation. So for example, let's pretend that we're going to do this. So um, we're going to take uh, 5.2. We're going to multiply it by uh, 12 plus 0 0.1295. And then we're going to take and divide that by uh, um, 1,000. OK, so let's look at the sig figs that are involved here. That's 2. That's 2. That's 4. That's 1. So we do this mathematical operation. And at the end of the day, we round to 1 sig fig. OK. So were you to actually do the calculation itself, see 
you would get zero point zero six three zero seven three four ah eh. this stuff over here is garbage because of the precision of our numbers going into it we're going to round this to one sig fig and if you look at this right here this rounds to point zero six so this right here is how you would round it and that's what i want from you so, find the number of sig figs that are in your calculation for each number, actually do the calculation, and then at the end of the day, round to the least number of significant figures. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about, uh, very briefly, is a discussion about dimensional analysis. And uh, dimensional analysis uh, uh, can be useful in helping you remember equations, which is not really relevant for this course because you can just look stuff up. Um, but what it, I personally find to be it really useful for is to make sure that the equation that you're dealing with actually gives you the answer that you're looking for, um, or at least uh, in the ballpark of. Now, what do I mean? Well. Um, let me give you a simple example of how you would do dimensional analysis. So uh, one of the equations that we're going to derive uh, when we start actually getting into the physics material is um, an equation for uh, kinematics. Uh, it tells you uh, how far you go given acceleration, given time, given initial velocity. And it looks like this. Now let me spell these things out for you. This is time. This is velocity. And this right here is acceleration. And this is something called displacement. Now let's talk about what uh, fundamental properties they measure. So uh, time, we know, is, is time. I'm going to call it just capital T. Velocity is like speed. Uh, we haven't talked about velocity before. We're going to be talking about it whenever we start to get into uh, the actual uh, physics content for uh, uh, the book, like I said. So velocity um, is, is like speed. It's measured in, uh, say, for example, in the metric system, meters per second. Well, meters is a length, length over time. Okay. Acceleration. Acceleration is how your velocity changes with respect to time. So your velocity is measured in meters per second. Uh, how your velocity changes with respect to time. It's on the bottom. Uh, meters per second squared or a length over a time squared. Displacement is a length. So the question that I want to answer here is does all of this garbage here on the right give me a length? Well let's take a look. Delta x is equal to one half a t squared plus v naught t. Let's just look at this part first. We're going to disregard the half because it's not a dimension, it's a number. Acceleration, though, from our discussion over here, looks like a length over time squared. This right here is a time squared. A length over time squared times a time squared gives you a length. What are we looking for? A length. This part right here gives us a length, so that looks like it checks out pretty well. Now what about this one right here? Velocity times a time. Well, as I discussed over here, Velocity is a length over a time. Time is a time. Times cancel, giving you a length. So what this means is, is this equation is at least heading in the direction of giving us what we're looking for. 
I'm asking for a length on the left hand side and if I look at the stuff that's on the right hand side it does in fact give me a length. So this is a simple way of making sure that your equation is going to give you what you're looking for or at least it gives you the proper units. Now uh, you've probably done dimensional analysis before if you've had a chemistry or something like that. That's just again a rough breakdown. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about this later on as I do more and more problems in the course. And that's it for this chapter.